It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the robust Robert Begley. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How you doing this afternoon, Robert? I am doing great, Andy. Looking for a victorious episode, okay? V for victory. Yes. <laughs> V for victory. Yes, ab absolutely. And who better, who better to, you know, uh, symbolize that than the, than the great Winston Churchill, perhaps the, the preeminent uh, statesman of the 20th century. There he is. Hands down in my opinion. The Roaring Lion. Yeah. That's the right. The lion. Roaring Lion. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the, the discussion on Churchill, I'm sure, will focus a great deal on his exploits during World War II. Uh, which you know really, uh, you know, you can't you can't overstate the importance uh, of Churchill in, no. in in defeating Nazi Germany and def defending liberty, and uh, so we'll, I th so we'll focus a lot on that. But his uh, his early years, right? And uh, sure. Churchill, what Churchill's Churchill's dates were eighteen seventy four to nineteen sixty five. So he's he's just months died just months short of his ninety first birthday, which is extraordinary. Amazing. Anybody, but given the the industrial strength quantities of alcohol that Churchill consumed <laughs> in his in his life, that he made it to age ninety, you know, is abs is even more remarkable. It is, Andy, and you know, w w just to fast forward a little bit, his first meeting with King George the Fourth. He's sitting there, and we'll talk a lot about the Darkest Hour, which was an excellent film that covers that great that movie, period. In great his movie. Life. Yes, <clears throat> but do you remember the scene when he's with? And this is accurate. He's with King George the Fourth, in in, and he's got his brandy, and King George is like, "How do you manage to drink in the daytime?" <laughs> do you remember his answer, Andy? Practice. He said, "Practice, <laughs> right? Yeah, practice." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So what would knock you and me out, I would just sniff that stuff and I'd be knocked out. For him, it was just a regular <laughs> par for the course. <laughs> yeah, he was like he was drinking Diet Coke or something. It seemed to have no, it yep. to have no impact on him. So yeah. you know, some people have a constitution that's just, is just extraordinary. I, I mean, I remember yep. when John Hersey and I did the episode of Michelangelo and he abused, he, he didn't sleep, he didn't eat, you know, Decent. He wasn't exactly on the regiment of Tom Brady. I mean, he did not take care. He did not take care of himself <laughs> at all. And he lived to be 80, uh, 89 or, or close to it. That's yes. back during you know, the 16th century. It, Some people just have the constitution of a mule. That's right. And, that's right. And you know what, you know, was I know what helps. Yeah. You know what helps with that? I think values. When, when people have something positive to live for, as Churchill and Michelangelo both did, obviously, it just, it, it aids the, I think it, I think it increases life expectancy. You, you have something to live for. I, I, I agree, Andy, and also mental activity, it, it, because if you notice with older people, once they start, once they tune out mentally, that's, that's a sign of their decline. And Churchill was mentally active, but yeah, if we go to his, his birth, he was born into, uh, his father was an incredible, you know, ha this background that he had as far as um, the Duke of Marlborough was like in, in <laughs> way back in his ancestors. So I think of him as the Marlborough man <laughs> of Great Britain. <laughs> One that, that reference, uh, some of the younger people may not know that since cigarette ads have been banned, but that was, that was a cigarette <laughs> commercial back in the day, 1970s, maybe, you know, 60s That's or 70s, right. maybe, you know, the Marlborough man was That's this right. rugged Western guy, cowboy. The rugged individual. Guy, you know, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. he spoke this Marlboro because mm -hmm. he had to spoke Marlboro in order to be a real man. That was the point of yeah. the ads. So, so, yeah. so, what yeah, so his father was Lord Marlboro. Randall. He was smoking cigars. Wait, he was a heavy cigar smoker as well as a drinker, wasn't he? George yes, George? heavy cigars, heavy heavy cigars, part of his regiment. Yeah. So he was born to Lord Randolph Churchill, and his mother Jenny Jerome was American. And we can't under overemphasize the American influence in his life. He came as a child to America with his mother on a tour and saw battlefields where whole towns were wiped out from the American Civil War. And he looked at Lincoln as the ultimate statesman 
who mastered the English language, both the written and the spoken word. Now, Churchill, the most prolific writer, I think, one of the most prolific writers and speakers in, in world history, I think more words have been written by him and about him than just about anybody. There's volumes. Well, his, William Manchester yeah, has this long... His, his history of the Second World War in six volumes runs like two million words. It's, it's, yeah. it's one, of the, one of the longest works of history ever written. And it's, it's, you know, I, I'm sure it has its flaws. It's been criticized and everything, but it's magnificent writing and, and history. And uh, it, it was a centerpiece of him winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. You know, his, his, yeah. his uh, history of the English speaking peoples and his history of the Second World War, are, you know, are, are classics. And he, his, Churchill had no professional training as a historian. He was just a, a brilliant uh, individual and he was a great great writer and, and, and speaker. So yeah, yeah, he, yeah, this, this, uh, his, his accomplishments as a historian are uh, may, maybe not as well remembered today as they should be. Everybody remembers him as the great prime minister who led the battle in World War II against Hitler as they should, but he was a great historian and, and that, that should be remembered too. You're right. You're right about that. Yes. Study history, study history. He would say it twice. That's how important. And it prepared him for everything you know, everything in life. But uh, so he's age 17 and he writes to a friend, he says, uh, because in part of his studying history, Andy, he had seen two examples, King Louis XIV, Frenchman and Napoleon of these megalomaniacs who wanted to take over all of Europe. And because Churchill studied history and he saw what was happening towards the end of the 19th century, he writes to a friend saying, well, I can see vast changes coming over a now peaceful world, great upheavals, terrible struggles, wars such as one cannot imagine. And I tell you, London will be in danger. London will be attacked and I shall be very prominent in the defense of London. So he's like 17 years old when he writes this, uh, 1891. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> and right. he right. was a visionary studying history. He would say the farther back you look, the farther forward, you know, paraphrasing him, the farther forward you can see, the vision you can see. And his whole life played that played out. You know, I just, you reminded me, I just saw a, a meme on Facebook that, that quoted uh, the great Thomas Sowell, who said, who said, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was to the effect that one of the one of the main reasons to study history is that you'll find that every stupid idea that's in vogue today has been implemented in the past and with disastrous results. And so, yes, you, you know yes. that's that's definitely definitely <laughs> true. And Churchill Churchill recognized you know the that in some form the the importance of history for understanding the present and if we're going to be able to predict the future, which is a very dicey proposition. But if we're going to be able to predict mm -hmm. it with any amount of uh, of certainty, we have it's got to be grounded in, in our mastery of the events of the you know, past. And Churchill understood, yeah. That so very uh, right, very well. right. So it, yep, he did. And and so if we continue on in his life, his his in his twenties, yeah. eighteen ninety five, he's with he joins the military. He's in different kinds of wars. He's he considers himself a war correspondent not a journalist. That was like, he looked down on that expression, but he would report on the war. And Andy, that's one reason why he was so good uh, in his his history of World War II, is he, he focused on essentials, on blunders, and uh, gave it th this descript descriptive style of writing that poured out, you know, emotion, made you feel like you were there. And- right. So he went to South, you know, he, he went to different areas where the British, uh, different British colonies for these wars. And in South Africa, he, he <laughs> jail broke, he broke out of, <laughs> uh, he, he was captured and in jail and he broke out and, and then wrote about the story. So it's kind of, kind of like, uh, it reminds me a little bit of, of Gail Wine and in the Fountainhead where you just write these fantastic, you, you stage these, <laughs> these stories and then write about it and then, become, you know, become popular. And I can't say he got captured on purpose, but he did escape and then he wrote about it. And that's one of the first things that really put him on the map. 
Yeah, he wrote about being in the, he was captured by the Boers, right, in uh, in South yeah. Africa. They had him in prison. He escaped from that. Yeah, he mentions that in, in World War, uh, in, 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 in the movie The Darkest Hour, when they're talking about with, with his secretary about the right way to flash the the, the, the V yeah. victory <laughs> sign. <laughs> she tells him, she tells him, you did it like this. It means up your bum. Mm -hmm. He said, up your bum. He said, he, he thought that. He's hilarious. cracking up at that. Yeah, yeah, she didn't want to tell him because he's the prime minister, and he said, and he says to her, "You know, I was in a bow of prison. You can tell me this, and you know." And she, she tells, she tells him <laughs> what it means in that form, and you can see Churchill says he he's he's laughing hilariously. And I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and you're right, Robert, we we will discuss the Darkest Hour. It's a great film, strongly recommended. I think, to the best of my knowledge, you know, a good deal of that is is accurate, although. And is in any in any film, I would imagine some of it is apocryphal, like that scene on the underground mm -hmm. with uh, with mm -hmm. uh, you know just everyday British citizens. I don't know whether that's true or apocryphal, but I doubt that that actually happened. Yeah, but but I don't I don't know that for sure. Do you, do you know? No, actually, I don't. Although I read the Darkest Tower book, they don't cover that. They they don't cover that scene. I, I paid attention <laughs> to that because it is. It, it, it's a unique, you know, it's a memorable scene, uh, for sure. Yeah, it's a great but, scene in the a great scene in the film. I imagine it's imaginary, but uh, yeah. I don't know that for sure. And I think it's a little, but a lot of the other things in the film are accurate, right? I mean, historically accurate. That's right. Uh, from, yeah. From the from yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely, it's a great movie. absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 So movie. he's we'll, 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 while we'll he's get, we'll get to it. And by the way, somebody said one we'll more get thing. To it. He also wrote he also wrote a history of the First World War. Uh, I forget the title of him, yeah. but Churchill wrote history of the First World War. So he was a prolific writer and historian, as well as the probably the greatest statesman of the century. Yeah. Yeah, I would say for the definitive site, WinstonChurchill.org, they have, they have a lot of his quotes and they have a lot of his misquotes too, because a lot of people attribute things to him. Like, remember, I've heard since I was a kid, if you're going through hell, keep going. And what what they do at this uh, in this organization is they verify every quote that's attributed to him, and they're like, "There's no evidence for this." And guess what? If he wrote and spoke so so much of his statements, so many of his statements are documented that if they're saying that he didn't, there's they couldn't find it. Uh, I tend to well, I tend if, to agree if with they, if these. If they went through the millions and millions of words that sh that Churchill wrote, never mind spoke, you, you know, just the ones he wrote, and couldn't yeah. find that. Well, you know, that that's that's that is certainly doing your due diligence. How about this one? Yes, this this is my favorite Churchill quote. Tell me if this is if this is real or not. What, what is it? Uh, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to carry on that that counts. Or something, yes, something that like is. That. That, that, that is him. Yeah. Paraphrasing. Yeah. That, that definitely is him because that is one of the ones in there. So during the late uh, 1890s, he's one of the amazing things about him is he's fighting in, ca in the cavalry and then he sees the new, the, the, um, the development of war weapons, weapons of, of, you know, mass destruction <laughs> to come up with the current term. And he sees there's going, there's going to be problems. He can definitely see that in the future, but during, he goes to Cuba at one point and on his way to or from Cuba, he stops in New York city and he writes to his mother, what an extraordinary people the Americans are. So now he's a, he's more of an adult. He went there when he was young, but he couldn't necessarily, you know, judge. But now he's in his twenties, and he goes there, and he he already sees a difference between Americans and Europeans, and and we will definitely talk more about that because I I think there are some essential differences, and as much credit as I always want to give Churchill, it was America that bailed out, you know, just like they did in World War One. It was America that bailed out. The European continent in World War II, but of course, yeah, with that, with that, Churchill talked about the English. And right. spe speaking speaking of that, you know, on, on, on some hero show upcoming, we need need talk about bailing out Europe uh, in the Second World War. We have Robert. We have to do an episode on George Patton. You know, I mean, we just have to do we have yes. to do a hero show yes. episode on on Pat. Yes, we may we may have to yeah. tone down the language a little a little bit. You know, when <laughs> when we discuss Patton, I agree. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the yeah. great one of the greatest military commanders in American history, uh, and of course, you, you yeah. know, helped liberate uh, 
uh, Europe from, from Hitler's grasp. But what, what, one point I want to make real quick before you, before you go on here, you mentioned before sure. that, his, that his mother, Jenny Jerome, was American. And I, if I remember correctly, she was the daughter of a wealthy American businessman, wasn't she? I forget his name offhand, but yes, I she think, was. I yeah. think uh, he, he, yeah, he, she, he she married up. I, 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 her, his father actually ma married up in the sense of, if we look at like wealth wise, you know, like in Britain, the, the, you could have these titles of nobility that you reach, but you won't necessarily have the wealth that an American uh, does. And Cornelius Vanderbilt proved that when he first went to Europe with you know the ship that he built, and they were they were just stunned that it, that a someone not born of nobility could be able to you know spend lavishly uh, from his from his own wealth. So yeah, that's right. uh, there's that's another. Good point. There's, yeah, there's another. Oh, we'll do him. <laughs> yes, yeah. we'll it's definitely do Vanderbilt soon. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was the, that became a cliche, you know, during the early days of capitalism in the 19th century. All of these, you know, uh, European nobility, especially in Britain, where capitalism and industrialization is, is birthed, uh, you know, had the titles, but they didn't have any money. And they, you know, as aristocrats often did, they looked down on commoners, you know, and here was the nouveau riche, you know, the the new the new wealth, the capitalist wealth. They looked down on, on them, you know, uh, from the aristocratic, you know, perch, but they had the money and so very often married into these uh you know the the, the middle class uh business people married into the aristocratic family the aristocratic family married yeah. you know the wealthy the wealthy business people and and so that you know that that, that became very common and that's what uh, churchill's father did in marrying an american heiress yeah and jenny jerome was a very beautiful woman as i as i recall his his, his mother i think she Right, right. She was. I think she was very, very. He says yeah, she, in the darkest hour in the movie. He says, "My mother was too well loved." He says, "I don't. I don't know if he's making some kind of if he's making some kind of you know insinuation about uh, a, a prolific love life that she might have had. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I know. I know she was a very, very attractive woman. Yeah, she was very attractive, and actually, there was somebody else uh, uh, who was like more of a caretaker to him. And I can't recall offhand, but when that woman died, he felt like that was she loved him, the caretaker, more than both of his yeah. parents. They they tended the to nanny. be a bit more distant. Yeah, the nanny. Right, the <laughs> nanny. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I forget that term. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I forget her name also. Uh, but yeah, he said when 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 she died, you're right. He said like I lost the best friend of my first twenty years. Yeah, because, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, his mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his parents were just not that loving. His mother. I, I don't know if she was having affairs or not. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I know. I know that she was estranged from his father. He says in, in the darkest hour. Again, I, I think this is accurate. He says, "My father." He says to the king, "He says my father, like God, was always busy elsewhere." <laughs> you know, so, something. That is accurate. Yes, that is yeah. that is accurate. That is accurate, and. He tried to please his father. That was, you know, how how common is this in in life, especially even if we go f farther back in time, where the son just tries and tries to please the father by doing these, taking on these incredible challenges, and sadly, that never really came. That was never the father never said, "Well done," you know. Now, now yeah. he outlived his father by seventy years. We'll talk about that at the end. So he never really saw him come to mature maturity but uh but yeah so just moving forward he goes on uh the civil the the world war one takes place and one of churchill's again because a student be because he was a student of history and he upheld the end he knew britain stood for the individual and, and there was a difference between britain and and all of the rest of europe that it was much more from the magna carta era straight on through the individual the life of the individual was much more valuable than in other european uh, and and forget about the eastern part of the world and churchill recognized that you know he he recognized that and um you know the world war one was it was terrible it was definitely terrible for britain oh, yeah. and uh and then after the war he 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 spoke out that was the other thing he saw things and he spoke out and he was always around pacifists and appeasers 
And here's a man of courage who sees the truth and sees the consequences of the truth. You know, if we go even to Ayn Rand, what was that paraphrasing her? I, I see the, I'm, I can't keep quiet. I see the consequences too clearly, you know, like, and therefore I have to speak up. And some, something like yeah, that. She said, that she, yeah, she said something like, I'm not brave enough to, to Yes, to I'm not brave. Silent. Thank you, Andy. You know, yeah, yes. yeah, that's, something, that's like, right. something like that. Churchill, yes. Yeah predated her in that sense. He tended to pre, right. you know, he was older by, by you know, 25, 30, 25, 30 years. So, uh, but the same thing. And because he spoke out and was surrounded by these appeasers, and he has a great expression for people who appease. He's like, they're the ones who want to feed the crocodile in the hopes that they are the last ones eaten. <laughs> 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 He's got a million of these just yeah, quick, yeah. short, punk, yeah, you know, just graphic. And it's like, right? So he's around appeasers and he and his, you know, his his status is questioned, you know, like he's too brash, he's too this, he's too that. So right. he can't he doesn't rise rise up, you know, the uh through like a chain of command. But and when, then when will we learn that? To, wait, 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 hold on a second. Let me. Is, is, when will we yes. learn that you can't reason with the tiger when your head is in its mouth? Right. He's, he says that again. In in in, in he <laughs> says that the you cannot. Uh, yes, you can't reason yeah, with a tiger reason. when your head is. In. Yeah, and yeah. again, the metaphors. He knowing the English language. This is one reason I, I admire him so much. And let me just. Take a, take a little diversion here. 1989 was the yeah, first right. time I went to London and I had friends in Oxfordshire. And I said, I have to go. I have to, I have to go to the Saint, oh boy, whatever that church is that he's buried in, uh, Saint something. And I, Andy, I had goosebumps, you know? And, and since then I've been to London many times. I always go to Hyde Park. In, in the corner, one corner of Hyde Park, there's this incredible statue of Achilles, like a gigantic statue and the and churchill is like two blocks away so i always go to this the, that's my way to say thank you to the man you know like uh, just personally i want to recognize what, what you know what he's done and f for decades now and and so um and why because he has i love him as a speaker and as a writer i love both of those you know things that are um uh disciplines are really important to me and I think he was again top, <laughs> top notch in both categories. So, uh, right. in fun, but metaphor is a big part of the spoken word and just showing things. So yeah, you can't reason with the tiger when your head is in its mouth. That's really one yeah, of the he says that. Yeah, he says mm -hmm. that in the in the film. He said in the film, the darkest hour. And again, I, I think this is accurate. He says that you know, uh, yeah. right around the time of Dunkirk when you know chamberlain and, and yeah. chamberlain's uh guys you know his his uh colleagues in parliament want to negotiate with hitler as hitler's triumphant he's conquering all of europe and and these and they're telling churchill well, what, what was his name halifax was that the uh the other halifax, uh, lord uh, halifax yes yeah yeah lord yes. halifax you know you know by the way speaking of the darkest hour i want, want to point some something out here it, it it shows chamberlain and halifax it it shows you know that that they want peace and they're, they're, they're not wrong about that peace they all went through world war one which was a bloodbath they don't want you know to reprise that so you it's the movie presents them sympathetically and accurately i think they want peace that's good the the key error of course is the belief that you could reason with hitler there's the crucial the crucial error halifax says to churchill and the way he says hitler will be reasonable they go what i don't think so you know you can't reason with the tiger when your head is in its mouth and uh you know churchill was that was was absolutely right he was on war manga he knew what the, the horrors of world war one he'd been there too he says he knew yeah he can't reason with hitler and he was and churchill was so, absolutely right about that he'd been warning about it for years yeah right during his wilderness and years when he was out of government in 1930s let's let's go right to his wilderness years so post-world war one yeah. Little by little, he, he thinks that the terms of the um, the armistice, Germany will not, th they're going to try to build up uh, again. So in the 20s, he's watching this and he starts speaking out about their military buildup. And then when in 1932, when Hitler gets elected, he 
sees that, or 33, when Hitler gets elected democratically, okay, by a, by, by a democratic election, Churchill starts speaking out more vocally. And this is what he's met with evasion. Like, like you said, Ch Chamberlain and others, they just think they can, they can deal with him. And, and because Churchill is courageous and knows there is evil, there are evil people. And in Hitler, he had seen the same pattern as Louis XIV and Napoleon, because they're these megalomaniacs who, want, who just want all of Europe under their, you know, un, under their uh, thumb. And uh, not only in the, in the film, and Andy, and now, now we can move, you know, we can kind of move into, into the film. Mussolini is his lackey, which he calls them. They, they, uh, Halifax and Chamberlain want to go to Mussolini instead of Hitler directly because no, we're closer right. to Italy. And Mussolini's also, he's, he's, he's already under Hitler's thumb. And oh, sure. Yeah. So yeah, that's the setup. That's the setup. How how the you know early on in the film, that's actually the same. Yeah. Uh, right. Between... Right. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, a couple of things. Hitler Hitler was yeah. um, elected. Hitler was elected to the Reichstag. You know, the German Parliament. He was appointed Chancellor by von Hindenburg. Uh, was, you know, so that's a detail. He came to the, the Nazis had what. I, I forget the National Socialist Party. I think the uh, uh, in in that election, 1933, they won 30 something percent of the vote. I don't, you know, I, I don't think they ever approximated 50 percent of the vote. But still, out a third mm -hmm. of the German voters voted for Hitler and National Socialism. That that in itself is uh, it, it is scary. Uh, but uh, yeah, also I think Churchill recognized. You know, Napoleon did a lot of great things. He, uh, he's very mixed case and 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 louis the 14th you know did good things too hitler's just a monster there's not there's nothing good there's nothing good uh about hitler he's you, you could take you know, the bad parts of napoleon and you know magnify it a million times without any of the good things in napoleon then you, then, then you have hitler and so, so i want to i want to I talk about a, a, a spend a few minutes robert on a, a little known sure. hero really really helped Churchill in 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 this this is this is Lawrence Reed's book Lawrence Reed the former head of uh can you see this the former mm -hmm. head of, of fee the foundation for economic education yeah it's a very good book I recommend it real heroes mm -hmm. inspiring true stories of courage character and conviction and Lawrence Reed recognizes the essence of heroism is character you know being you know being committed to the good and I think uh this this is my book Hero, everybody uh, watching the show probably knows this. Heroes, Legends, Champions, Why Heroism Matters. Uh, my book is about, it's about the nature of a hero. La Larry Reed's book is, is about real heroes. It's, it's, it's biographical about, you know, about uh, uh, characters who really were heroes. Uh, so, so it's like uh, this, book, this book gives a lot of the uh, particulars, a lot of the specific heroes that, you know, my book talks about. Uh, theoretically, so I think it comp they complement each other very well, and, and some of some of the heroes that Lawrence Reed discusses in this book are little known. Some of them are famous. Some are little mm -hmm. known. I, you know, me, the hero, lifelong hero worship. I never heard of of some of these people. Mm -hmm. uh, now listen to this. So this this does this does bring us back to Churchill, uh, the Duchess of Athol, Scottish noblewoman. Her name was uh, her married name was Catherine uh, uh, Murray Murray Stewart. She married. I'm sorry, Catherine Stuart Murray. She married the Duke of Athol in uh, in Scotland, and she was a contemporary of Churchill. She was one of the early ones, first of all, to recognize the dangers of the Soviets of communism when so many Westerners were appeasing the Soviets, and she denounced them, you know, as uh, as evil, you know, for the right reason. And Larry Reed says, you know, she denounced the rats in Moscow, as he as he put it. So, but this is what we want, we want to talk, but we, we want to tie this to Churchill. Uh, after 1933, the Duchess of Athol's, and she was a member of Parliament, you know, from Scotland. Uh, the Duchess, in a conservative party, the same party as Chamberlain, uh, Churchill, and so forth. Uh, after 1933, Athol's wrath turned against the rats in Berlin. <laughs> I love the language. When when she when she read Hitler's Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, in 1935, she entertained no illusions about where the Führer was headed. Quote. Never can a modern statesman have made so startlingly clear to his reader his ambitions, unquote, she later said. 
in Lynn Olson's words, this, this formerly diffident woman was becoming the boldest Tory rebel of all. Many now think of Winston Churchill as the sage who opposed Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement, but the Duchess of Athol helped stiffen his spine. She sent mm. Churchill both the original German edition of Mein Kampf and the English translation. The translation she showed him was a whitewash, barely a third the length of the German original, cutting out what Olsen calls Hitler's most, quote, Hitler's most inflammatory statements, particularly his expression of hatred for Jews, unquote. The Duchess sent Churchill similar passages from Hitler's speeches that had not been reported outside Germany. Uh, so she, she was the one, little known, I, I had never heard of, uh, of her. She was mm -hmm. one of the ones who first, you know, during Churchill's wilderness years, who first warned Churchill about the dangers of Hitler, you know, sent him the, the full translation of, of, of Mein Kampf so Churchill could really could see who, yes. who Hitler re really was. She stood up against Neville Chamberlain when, you know, peace in our time, you know, with uh, yeah. uh, his, his uh, when he sacrificed uh, parts of Czechoslovakia to Hitler's power lust. Uh, her own husband and other members of the conservative party said to, to, to Go along with with Chamberlain. She she refused. She she refused. She she denounced it as as, as appeasement. And uh, you know, and Chamberlain was enraged. He he uh, he uh, didn't back her in it for election. He 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 yeah, as the head of the Conservative Party did everything he could to get her voted out. And uh, let me read one more thing. Churchill was was going to go to Scot Scotland on her behalf uh, to to mm -hmm. campaign for her in this very hotly contested election. They say that Larry Reed says Chamberlain used every dirty trick, politi political dirty trick in the book to try and get the mm -hmm. Duchess voted out. So, but Chamberlain changed his mind. He didn't go, uh, Churchill changed his mind, but didn't go. But he sent a, a public message of endorsement uh, for her to use in her campaign. Churchill wrote, quote, you are no doubt opposed by many conservatives as loyal and patriotic as yourself. But the fact remains that outside our island, your defeat at this moment would be relished by the enemies of Britain and of freedom in every part of the world. It would be widely accepted as another sign that Great Britain no longer has the spirit and willpower to confront the tyrannies and cruel persecutions which have darkened this age, unquote, mm -hmm. from Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. Quoting from wow. Larry Reed, she, she lost by a heartbreakingly slim margin so chamberlain won that battle but of course we know uh that the duchess of athol's uh, warnings were proven correct shortly after when when churchill mm -hmm. uh, when hitler turned out to be the exact rat she was larry words larry reached him, the exact yeah. rat that she had uh, depicted him uh to be and chamberlain was dead wrong in his not in his desire for peace that's understandable but in his belief that hitler could be negotiated with hitler could be reasoned with the duchess of and Churchill were proven right by by that. Yeah, that's that's great, Andy. And I don't um, a little little known heroine. The, maybe maybe little yeah. known heroine, right? Maybe she deserves her own episode on the hero. Show, <laughs> maybe but, yeah, at least a segment. And th thank thank you for raising yeah raising her up. But it, it also reminds me that Churchill had a chance to meet Hitler. And he, you're right, he did read Mein Kampf and it bothered him. It bothered him about the Jews. He was an advocate of the Jews when they were not allowed into uh, all these British establishments. You know, they, they were not allowed uh, and they couldn't be doctors. They could, I think they could only be lawyers uh, back then in that era. And Churchill fought for, for that and eventually uh, forecast into the future having their own uh, state in Palestine. He even uh, fought for that. But right. the, this was one aspect he knew about Hitler, and there was a chance that he could meet him. Uh, but he spoke to Hitler's, uh, you know, the guy, who, the German guy who was who was going to coordinate the meeting. And Churchill said, uh, uh, "His policies are, are about the Jews are they're reprehensible." And basically, Hitler blew him off. You know, like he 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 refused to see Churchill. So. You know, if we talk, if we now, if we go like to the movie, one of my one of my absolute favorite scenes is when the king 
meet, uh, you know, has these regular, you know, weekly meetings with uh, Churchill. And <laughs> Churchill says it's like having your tooth pulled once a week. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's how he looks at these meetings. But the, but uh, the king says, I confess, I had some reservations about you at first. But while some in our country dreaded your appointment, none dreaded it like Adolf Hitler. And whatever can strike fear into that brute's heart is worthy of all our trust. All right, so the king changes his mind and he was, he was in tight with Halifax and Chamberlain and they show that in the beginning of the film. Yes. And, but things are going south. You know, the evasion only goes so far and the appeasement only goes so far until it's on your doorstep. Or as, <laughs> you know, as Churchill eloquently says, you know, you can't reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. And and that is, you know, that's one of the pivotal, you know, pivotal scenes that they realize this, this is the guy. And, and now again, um, again, you, you, you read yeah. the book. I, I have, have not, that's, that scene is, is accurate. I, I assume when, when the yeah. king. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah that's it's, it's yes, just, it is. It, you know, I mean, no, it, it chokes it chokes me up. You know, when he says just what you said, nobody feared your appointment as much as Adolf Hitler. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, you're right because Hitler, you're right. Hitler, Hitler recognized Churchill was the one who would stiffen the spine of the Brits to fight. Whereas you know, yeah. his other leaders, Chamberlain yes. and so forth, may would would uh, would surrender. Churchill will, will not yeah. surrender. And you're gonna have a hell of a battle on your hand to invade yeah. Great Britain and, 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 and get the Brits to surrender. You're going to have a hell of a battle. And in the, in, in the event, of course, it proved impossible. Uh, yeah. Churchill, uh, Churchill was able to uh, revamp the RAF, you know, rebuild the RAF, the Royal Air Force, to the point where they blew the Luftwaffe out of the sky and, uh, and the Germans had no chance of crossing the channel. But uh, yeah, right. yeah, 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 Churchill was the one to to uh to stiffen the brit spine to you know to to, to fight you know for, for victory yeah so let, let, and, let's yeah, give, yeah, let, yeah, go let, ahead. let me go give ahead. a quick the quick quote that really changed the direction he says you ask what is our aim i can answer in one word victory victory at all costs victory in spite of all terror victory however long and hard the road may be for without victory, there is no survival. Thank you, Elliot, for putting that up for us. Because yeah, that, is, that is it. Victory. The word is Churchill. You know, that's that's the concept. Boils down to that man in that pose. <laughs> so, perfect. Uh, well, like Churchill, you said in the film. Yeah, you know, and, and it just it moves you to tears. You know, in in the movie, and just thinking about reflecting on the real life when he's speaking to parliament uh and he, you know he says we sh i don't remember the exact quote but we shall fight them you know on the beaches we shall fight yes. them on the landing yeah. grounds we shall that was fight them on. in yes. the fields mm -hmm. yeah we shall <laughs> fight them in the fields and in the hills will we will never surrender i mean it's like wow 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 you know and in the in the film when somebody asks uh, halifax which has happened Halifax says, you know, he, he mobilized the English language and sent it to uh, yeah. war. <laughs> yes, that's but, right. But, that's yeah. right. And Andy, what happened right before then? The, the, so let's, let's just backtrack. He tells Churchill, go to people. They'll tell you. They'll tell you what, you know, he's because they're not sure. They're not being told the truth of what's happening. And he, he gets out, you know, he's in his, in, in his limo and he gets out and goes down to the underground and starts talking with the people. And what do they tell him? Never. The little girl, you know, she's like, never, never, never <laughs> give up, you know? And then that leads him to exactly that BBC. Yeah. Right. Uh, speech I don't know if is. that, I don't know if that scene is accurate. It strikes me as unlikely. But what a great dramatic scene in the film. And yes. it captures, let's put it this way. It captures the spirit of what happened. It may not be accurate to the letter uh, historically, but it captures the spirit of Churchill, you know, and, and the English people in the underground telling him, what do you say? What do you, he tells them the truth, right? The full truth. Yeah. The Nazis, yeah. you know, uh, conquered Europe. They may in, in, invade Ireland. What, what, what are you doing? They'll say, fight. You know, we'll fight the fascists. One woman says, we'll fight with broomsticks if necessary. Yes. You know, she says. It's so powerful. And, and, um, and 
what is he, he it, it, it's so done artistically, it's so beautiful because he forgets his matches on the, uh, in, in the meeting with the council and he, he leaves and then that's how, that's how he breaks the ice with the people. Cause he's like, haven't you ever seen a prime minister on the underground? Yeah, yeah. They're all, they're all, they're all like, in awe. The prime yeah. minister's on the underground. <laughs> and he says, anyone have a match? The guy gives them the light and then it breaks the ice. And then he asks yeah. them their names. Then when he goes back, you know, they tell him their story. Then he goes back to, to the council and he's got the matchbook. Yeah, this one person said that and that one. But what about Andy? What about when the guy, when he starts reading the poem and the, the black guy finishes the poem for him and he's in tears. And the little girl yeah. says, there's something I like about Churchill. His, he wore his emotions on his sleeve. He was not afraid of crying, you know, ma as manly a man as he was. He, he wasn't afraid of crying, knowing the depth of emotion of human life, you know, that, that is about to be lost. If much more would be lost if they did nothing. And compared to just standing up and fighting and the little girl says to him, are you crying? And the other scene I love is with the little baby. And then the mother says, oh, he looks like you. And he says, old babies look like me, <laughs> which is true, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that round face. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> with the two <chill>, drooping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let, let, me, let me ask you something about Dunkirk, because this is, a, this is a, an, an absolute disaster in the making. Right, the British yeah. army is is trapped on the beach. You know, something like three hundred thousand. The whole yeah. professional mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Br British army, uh, and the Royal Navy can't cross the Channel to rescue them because you know, the Luftwaffe controls the skies and will blow will blow the British ships out of the out of the water. So in the film Darkest Hour, again, I strongly recommend this to everybody. Uh, yeah. Churchill is credited with the idea of. Let, let's get together with our, basically an armada of civilian craft in the event, it was like 850 or more, that many of them under civilian command crossed the channel on a cloud, it was a cloudy day, the Luftwaffe, yeah. you know, was, was uh, didn't have good visibility and brought back, this is Operation Dynamo, right? Brought back all, all the, almost all the British troops off the beach at Dunkirk. Was that Churchill's idea in fact, or did, did, did he get that from, from somebody else? I think it was, I think, you know, he was desperate. He was desperate and he, again, if he, if he didn't originate the idea, he was the one that saw the value in it. Okay. So I think it's, it's yeah. kind of less important, but because he was, he was a strategist on top of everything else, because war was just, the man studied war and he studied tactics yeah. and strategy. And, but and, he, uh, if, he, you know, he's, and he says, he says in the film, we are a seafaring people. We have been since the bronze age, the channel is yes. our moat. It would make sense that you know that he would it would occur to him and or like you said if somebody else broached it that he would immediately see the significance of it and yeah. you know um, most of eight hundred and fifty uh, civilian owned boats I think were captained by civilians when they some of them I think were co opted by the Royal Navy but most of them I think were captained by the civilian owners who patriotically yes. you know risked their Absolutely. lives to cross the Across the channel, risk their lives against the possible Luftwaffe, you know, uh, air raids to to rescue those boys uh, and young men off the off the beach at, at Dunkirk. It's one of the greatest yeah. triumphs, military triumphs of our age. I can remember as a little boy that I I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. My dad, of course, obviously lived the World War II. I remember him saying. He said, you can't beat the Brits. He said, they crossed the channel. <laughs> Again, this, this chokes me up in rowboats, yeah. practically. He put, that wasn't rowboats. Yeah. It was, you know, fishing yeah. boats and pleasure craft. But, but I get my dad's point. The British would have crossed in rowboats if they could bring back two or three of their guys, you know. And, and uh, what, what, would Hit, what did Hitler think? He had the whole British army trapped. They were surrounded. And yeah. the Luftwaffe controlled the skies. The Royal Navy was helpless. I wonder what Hitler thought when he, when he found out. The British sent, you know, fishing boats, you know, and pleasure uh, cruisers, yeah. uh, uh, manned by, you know, captained by civilians, and got the whole, practically the whole army off the beach at Dunkirk and back to England. I saw winning the war for Germany just became enormously more difficult because there's no way you're yeah. going to capitulate now. They're going to fight, and they have their whole army there. And you know the British army is going to fight far more effectively on British soil, defending British soil, than they did in France. Yeah, so let's talk, let's backtrack a little bit to France because in the movie you remember when Churchill goes to France, 
tries to speak in French and they're like English. And, and yeah, you're right. he, he's shocked. So in the book, listen to this, Andy, in the book, he's trying to reach the top, some of the, several of the top military advisors. Two of them can't be reached at home. They can't be reached at, in, in like the war room, so to speak. Two of them, is, they're found with their mistresses. Okay. <laughs> Basically, in other the words, French. they're evading. <laughs> That's Man, the French, yeah. yeah but they're, but they're and, making love, love, though, you know. Make love, not war, Robert. Come on, you know. You <laughs> yeah feed the crocodile hoping you're the last one eaten in effect so that's that's yeah, the way i see at, that at, at, at least we'll make love before he gets sent off to auschwitz you know but, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but again he was shocked that how easily france collapsed okay and it cannot be understated that he's saying we were allies in world war one you know and we have to have this bond and they just folded like a house of cards. And this is, again, where the respect for the individual, this is the British, this is the distinct, the superiority, I'll say it flat out, superiority of the of the British mind compared to the French mind after upholding the rights of the individual and the sovereignty versus being a subject of the state, uh, which which the French were just had a lot more experience with that. So, um, so con just continuing on af after that, he's he's uh, you know he's gaining some momentum w uh, throughout the war. You know there there's the the king says I'll back you. Remember Andy? He sits down next to him yeah. and he says I'll I'll support you. You know, and that's like a pivotal moment in the film. Churchill's like shocked. And that was the end of the, you you you're not afraid of me anymore. A little, <laughs> right? He says a, a little. I'm I'll, still, I'll, still afraid but I'll of you. I'll I'll cope. The king says, <laughs> yeah. "Yeah, it's a really." And then when, when Churchill's, you know, he's he's making his case, and he kept, keeps getting interrupted. And then he he butts in. And he says, "Stop, stop interrupting me when I'm interrupting you." <laughs> you know? yeah, he says to Halifax. Yeah, that's right. That's they just right. can't. They way, just the, catch all of them. Go ahead. Right. right. The, the, the film we're talking about, in case people haven't seen it, The Darkest Hour, Gary Oldman yeah. as Winston Churchill, won Best Actor at Oscar, I, I think. The film should have won yeah. Best Oscar. I mean, Best Film, Best Movie yeah. Oscar. It didn't. It was nominated, but didn't. I don't remember what did win that year. But Who the, cares? The, 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 yeah, the, the Oscars Academy, are a joke now. Yeah, they're, they're a joke some, now. Some, Sometimes the Academy gets it right. You know, The King's yeah. Speech, speaking of The King, you know, yes. uh, was a very good film and deserved the best. Uh, Oscar, the best uh, film Oscar that it was. Sometimes they get it right, but yeah, you're right. A lot of times it's polit it's politically motivated, uh, you know, rather than rather than artistically motivated. But magnificent movie, uh, the darkest now, and and generally accurate. I think in the details, and certainly in the spirit, it captures the spirit in of the, spirit, the lion, yeah. the roaring lion of uh, of England. You're perfectly. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's well, a, coming it's coming a, back to America. Now he's pleading for America to get involved, and Roosevelt doesn't want to. Roosevelt ran on a non-intervention uh, policy, and and Churchill's pleading with him in 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 the movie. He makes that call, and he's like, but "What about the, the the planes that we bought from you? That we bought from you with the money we borrowed from you." <laughs> it, shows, it shows like how how desperate he is and roosevelt's like uh, you know we could bring give you horses we can bring it to the canadian border and transport it by horses and that's that's the best we could do so uh so yeah in, it's not covered in the movie american involvement <clears throat> But he also gives the blood, sweat, toil, and tears. You know, I always think of the rock band when when I think of that. I heard of them way before I heard of the rock band way before I heard of Churchill. So, but what a beautiful, you know, um, another another metaphor. Like this is what I'm willing to offer, and so <clears throat> just a you know a great. Absolutely a great film. Dunkirk as well, I thought was very good. Not, maybe not as on that scale, but I thought that film uh, the movie, similarly showed the, bravery. Yeah, the film Dunkirk. Uh, yeah. Uh, the interesting thing about that movie is it's the same event shown from different perspectives. And it yeah. could be, it could be, I saw that movie seven or eight times. Uh, wow. You know, <laughs> yeah. Okay. You don't realize. On, on several viewings, uh, you, you don't realize it's the same events 
looked at looked at from different perspectives yes. and in different in different time frames. So it could be very yeah. confusing. But I thought okay. yeah, I thought Dunkirk. I thought Dunkirk was was very good. Uh, who directed that? Was his the Nolan? Is is uh, I forget his I forget his Christopher story. Nolan. Yeah, Christopher, Christopher Nolan. Nolan who who who, who, like who directed the, the the dark tri the dark knight trilogy didn't dark knight yeah Nolan? yeah I actually like yeah, this for Batman. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and Dunkirk's very good it's just it's 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 complex and you have to yeah. you have to be able to un unpack it but it does show yeah. you know the bravery of you know of, of these English civilians crossing the channel and you know and getting their boys uh, off the beach at Dunkirk and and, and getting them back home it's, you know, so yeah that's a mag yeah. magnificent um but at the end so of, of Darkest Go ahead, go ahead. I just had a couple more with Darkest Night, then we can move on, but go ahead with your points, Andy. Uh well, at the end of Darkest Hour, they they show Churchill giving that rousing speech, you know, the parliament. Yes. It's so powerful because he says, yes. even if it, he says something like, I don't I can't remember the verbatim, but he says something like, I don't believe this for one second. But even if we're conquered, you know, uh our colonies you know, support you know, beyond the sea, supported by the Royal Navy, will keep up the struggle until you know. Again, this always chokes me up. He says, in, in until in, in the fullness of time or something, he says the new world, yes. you know, in all of its power and yes. glory, will rise up and come yeah. to the rescue of the old. And I remember sitting yeah. in the movie theater, you know, you know, with with my daughter Penny, and say to, he's yeah. talking about us. He's talking about yeah. America. You know, yeah. Um, and it, it says very. Is very, perfect very ending powerful, very touching yeah perfect yeah, ending and i'll tell you if i had a complaint if i had a criticism about the movie on the heels of that the then they you know they the screen gives you the graphics of what happened and it says britain and its allies won the war <laughs> and that me as an american i'm like well i don't think we should just be given the allies you know lowered the status of the allies i would put america there because frankly you know we are the ones that actually went in there and won the war we could quibble over the importance of that but it is a british film and it's an excellent film just my last thing though andy is clementine let's talk about his wife i mean the the, yeah. the love yeah. for the two of them is beautifully dramatized how she stands up to him how she encourages him you know, early on when the when the new typist comes in for him and she's and, and Churchill scares her, <laughs> you know, and she runs downstairs and Clementine calms her down and then talks to Churchill and brings him to reason because he's too, you know, he's too emotional and and uh, she's fat. She, uh, Clementine deserves credit on in any discussion of yeah. Churchill. We have we have to you mention are, her. You are abs her. absolutely right. She she was an extraordinary woman. Yeah, absolutely. Right. She she stood up to Churchill. She stood by him through yes. through every every crisis. She was a rock, you know, of support for Churchill. And she was uh, she was witty in her own you know right, just as yeah. as he was. And in in, in the film, they they were discussing you know this is 1940. They discussed when they first met. You know, some like. 35 yes. years earlier or you know, something like that and he says to her the uh, something like well when i first saw you i was struck speechless and she says well i must have been mighty beautiful to bring about that miracle wonderful absolutely wonderful yeah you know she had she had the wit you know and the intelligence to uh to you know to be a, the perfect rock of support for churchill through the all these these dark yeah. years these dark times yeah and she was a, she was a remarkable woman clementine yeah uh, so yes. moving on after if, if we could wrap up the you know that segment of churchill's life because he still had another 20 you know solid 20 well, years let me let me, let me let me let me yeah, yeah, yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. hey, let me say something else about that because right after the war Churchill's voted out of office. The, the British vote in the 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 Labour Party. Clement Clement Attlee, who in the movie uh, uh, Churchill described as a sheep in sheep's clothing. <laughs> but but anyhow, they vote in Clement Attlee, the Labour the Labour Party leader, and uh, uh, Ch you know he, Churchill says something like, you know, Clementine, you know, they being voted out of office. Clementine said to me that it was. Uh, uh what, what did she say there was uh it was a uh, 
the silver line. It was always a blessing. In, no, she said it was a blessing in disguise. And Churchill said, yes, it was very well disguised. <laughs> she thought, <laughs> 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 the blessing, the blessing. <laughs> Anyway, he's voted Maybe, back into yeah. office. Yeah, 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 years years later. I just want to say one 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 other thing here that Churchill recognized the evils of the Soviets, uh, just as you know he recognized the evils of National Socialism, and as his colleague, you know, uh, Catherine, uh, you know, Duchess of Athol, you know, criticized, you know, went after the rats in Moscow and then the rats in Berlin, and Churchill in a in a a speech given in America. He's the one who coined the term the Iron, the Iron Curtain, right? Of this, uh, this he popularized right? it. In, in one book he, I read, he didn't necessarily coin it, but he pop. It's called the Iron Curtain speech, the first speech okay. that he gave in 1946. So he definitely popularized it, Andy. I mean, that's one of those you know those things. Whether he created it or not, it's it's a graphic notion that you don't forget. You know, and, yeah. And so he definitely gets okay. credit. Yep, for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he recognized mm -hmm. the, the totalitarian, you know, the evil nature of communism and that they had they had constructed this ring of steel or you know, an iron curtain around their their satellite nations, their Soviet empire, that you know, the, these nations in Eastern and Central Europe that they had uh, captured and you know, conquered and, and dominated. And they will kill you if you try and get out. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, it's yeah. a brutal totalitarian system. And Churchill recognized evils of communism as well as of, of national socialism. And for that, he also uh, deserves a great deal of credit. A lot of people, you know, back then, well, their, their mentality was uh, better better dead than red, right? I'm, I'm sorry, better red than yeah. dead. Better to capitulate to the Soviets than, you know, than get yep. killed in a nuclear war. That wasn't Churchill's attitude anymore. He wasn't, he wasn't willing to, to surrender to the communists any more than he was to the Nazis. No, I'll give you, Andy, you anticipated me with two, two of your oh, points. Sorry. So on communism, he calls it a pestilence more destructive of life than the Black Death or the spotted typhus. <laughs> about Lenin, he wow. says his purpose is about Lenin, his purpose is to save the world. His method is to blow it up. <laughs> All right. We see that to the you know, to this day, that kind that kind of mentality. So one reason he lost, you know, why how could this man who's at the height of popular most famous po politician, although properly he's a statesman and not a politician. There's a, there's a distinction there. That's why we titled this episode, The Victoria Statesman. But so he, uh, the wave of socialism, the, the British people were tired of privations. Okay, they, they had suffered war and everything was rationed. Now you have these intellectuals and politicians pushing this glorified ideal of what socialism will promise. And the public, the, the British public got caught up in that. And, and Churchill, uh, you know, he just ran on his name. He didn't really go on the, the offensive. And, and, and it, it, actually he had, he had written a book. He wrote the five chapters of a book on socialism. He couldn't find a publisher because they were so soft on the left. So these same, appeasers uh, uh, who he had challenged, proved wrong in the past were just revisiting, you know, revisiting the, the situation in the 1940s. So that's the socialism uh, aspect. Then with the Russians, his, he, he, he said we should push as far east as possible. When it comes to post-World War II, go as far east, put, leave the Russians as far east as possible because he knew that was the next threat. When even Americans, again, his foresight, even Americans didn't know the, da the danger of Russia because they were, quote, an ally in the war. Churchill right. saw that right away and started speaking out about it. Truman invited him to his college, um, Westminster College, like in the Midwest. And Churchill says, I, I like the name of this college. I think I've been <laughs> there once or twice. Right. And right. so he made the, 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 like you call it, the Iron Curtain speech. And he's met, there's, there's kind of a, a, a distance, be, uh, an arm's length distance, because again, he's too vocal. He sees the consequences and will not keep his mouth closed. But the dominant force, the intellectual uh, uh, of the direction of intellectuals was towards socialism. And so he, you know, and, and also he wanted to reintroduce Germany into Europe at a time when there was still a lot of you know hostility what what do you mean what look what they just did and he's like no it was the leadership 
that did that. But they have somewhat of, I can see, you know, in his voice, he would say, there's some, it's, yeah, they corrupted this one idea, but I can see them coming back into the European fold, which is precisely what, you know, precisely what happened there. Yeah, but no, absolutely. And one, one of the few Americans who recognized that Churchill was right about the Soviets and who was there on the ground, we mentioned just before was General Patton. And Patton wanted yes. to fight the Russians. Patton wanted to fight the Russians then and there. I mean, you know, yes. he, and he was right. He, he and Churchill were both ways. We got. We're gonna have to fight in, in Patton's language. You know, we're gonna have to fight these sons of bitches. You know, yes. uh, sooner or yes. later, let's get it done. Now we have a massive army here in Europe. Yes. They can't. They they have a massive army too, but they can't counter our air force. Our air superiority no. is is massive. Well, not to mention we have the bomb, and you know, and they don't. Uh, we could beat the hell out of these bastards right now. And then if 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 uh, if uh, Roosevelt and later Truman had listened, uh, the world history uh, could have been very different, much to the better. You know, the, communism had yeah. been obliterated. Communism had been obliterated. You know, in the night in the nineteen forties. Anyhow, uh, similarly, can I interject? Yeah. Similarly, on yeah, the eastern, uh, on the eastern <laughs> part of the world, MacArthur didn't trust the Chinese, so he wanted to squash that, you know, communist revolution that was brewing in China. And again, he, and his, just like Patton, he he was thwarted in his efforts, and so the, so communism the military men, we know, yeah. yeah. Communism yeah. proliferated. We know with what result. Minimum of a hundred million innocent civilians murdered by that yes. uh, brutal yes. system. So Churchill, you know, yeah. Churchill right, right again. I'm, I just I mentioned before that phrase that was popular amongst leftists when I was a kid. You know, you're better red than dead. You know, better being mm -hmm. you know, dominated by the communists mm -hmm. than dying in a nuclear war. The same mentality. I don't think they said it in the 1930s, but that same mentality might have said, you know, better brown than in the ground. You know, better better we capitulate to the to the Nazi brown shirts than you know than than get get killed in 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 warfare. But you know that was appeasement was not Churchill's uh, destiny, right? I mean, he uh, yeah. he was a true hero. And by the way, yeah. he mentioned something that surprised me. Uh, he mentioned in a letter, I think, to his mother that you know he uh, was an agnostic. He he didn't he, he didn't have he. he he didn't have any. He didn't have much use for Christianity. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, you know, was not a believer in God. Uh, he said he preferred preferred Protestantism to Catholicism because it was one step closer to reason. Uh, yeah. You know, Churchill yeah. said. So I. I mean, this this, this was mm -hmm. a this was a great man in many 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 ways. In many ways, also he saw the the threat of Islam. Uh, back then, that they were barbarians in war, they had no real values. India, you know, he's all, he's often criticized about his treatment of Gandhi in India, and he was like, "There's 120 languages in that in that land, in that subcontinent, and they're going to be at war with each other." And guess what? To this day, Pakistan and India still, you know, they're they're still at war. It was England that that effectively united the country into, you know, into into one unit. And much of these criticisms yeah, and the, are the, the, how, how, yeah, the languages, but also the religion, the the, the sectarian yeah. conflict on the Indian yes. subcontinent is just endless. You know, the Muslims, the Hindus, Sikhs, uh, you know, and and, and other de other denominations, it's, it's it's endless and brutal and and murderous. I mean, Gandhi himself was assassinated by. Hindu fanatics who didn't who didn't like his uh, plans of making peace with with the Muslims, uh, you know. Yeah. So yeah, your church, your church. He knew was, there'd be religious uh, wars. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He knew between the yeah, Hindus just, and the Muslims it's, it's, there would be religious wars. Yeah. And yeah. The, so and, again, and Sikhs, studying history. And the Sikhs will become yeah yeah exactly study history. The Sikhs Sikhism started out as a pacifistic religion and they became mighty warriors because of per, uh, persecution by by islam and they became known as you know mighty warriors against islam so uh, by, yeah. by the way today if you if you you know a lot of americans you see the, some, some of the sikhs with their turbans you know and uh, you know say, you say something about islam today as if they the, the sikhs don't take kindly to that you know to be to no. be confused <laughs>
uh, to be confused with, with no. Muslims. But that, but that religious warfare that's going to go on for a long time. And Churchill, uh, Churchill knew yeah. that, uh, that 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 was pervasive on the Indian Indians uh, subcontinent. Yeah, you're right. He's criticized for his imperialist views, but uh, you know he was right about a, about a lot of things I mean, one last point i want to make i think it came from yeah i think it, i think it came from dinesh d'souza uh actually um mm -hmm. who said like his his grandfather i I'll see if i'm remembering this correctly his grandfather said to him the british did so many good things in india you know they they wiped out diseases they improved education yeah. you know they they you know they did so many good things in india so i wish i could like them but, but they were so snooty and aristocratic and so looked down on no, their noses at us that I just I just hate them. But there's a there's a good you good know point. Uh, attempt at objectivity. You know, he hates them because they were snooty and you know and and you know aristocratic and you know and domineering and in, in you know in, in that way, contemptuous of you know others as 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 being lower class, but can still recognize all the great things the British did in India. Yeah. Yeah. So just move, moving on to, to the, towards the end of his life, he's, he is, he's doing a lot of writing. Whenever he wasn't in office, he was writing, he was a writing machine and he did it for pay. Yeah. He made a good, he, he made way more money writing than as a politician. So, uh, he, he, that was his way and he painted as well. So he was a Renaissance man. Yeah. Yeah. Churchill <laughs> was a very way. accomplished painter. He was a very accomplished yeah. painter, amateur painter. Yeah, yeah. So at one point, as he's aging, and uh, a little boy comes up to him and he says, "Sir, are you uh, are you the greatest man in the world?" <laughs> and Churchill's like, "Yes." Now bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that's, that's his mentality you know so he did yeah. he, and and so you you want to like him but there are things about him that are that are you know like somewhat embarrassing but we go in the hero show we right. emphasize you know we know there are flaws we know heroes uh, are, are many are flawed but the giant the, the stat from the cavalry if we span his life as 90 years and I just want, I'll, I'll finish uh, on his deathbed in his last couple of words, but from the cavalry to the nuclear age, and he was he was in favor of nuclear power. He was in favor of tanks. He flew airplanes in 1913, 10 times a day, he would get up. So technology, he saw, right. he, he saw and, the, and the, he the wanted, benefit of technology. He wanted, he wanted Britain to develop an atomic bomb to be able to, to defend itself yes. against the Soviets. Yes. And, yeah, so... Uh, in the 1950s, um, he's he, he's having breakfast, I think, with uh, with one of his peers, and it's January 24th, and he says, "Oh, this is the day that my father died, January 24th," and he says, "I'm going to die on that day." Sure enough, a couple of weeks before January 24th, 1965, he has a stroke, and he's kind of in and out of coma. His last words, he says, "It's been a great, a grand journey, well worth making." once and then and that's it dies on Jan <clears throat> january 24th 1965 and celebrate you know his recognizing him ireland you know we talk we talk about the souza talking about india ireland didn't recognize him of course they in, in the 60s there were heavy clashes with uh with the british at the time and uh, but most of the rest of the world recognized, e even countries that were, quote, oppressed by Britain, exactly like what D'Souza said. They, they gave us something, okay? They, they, they would often say, we don't have bread, but we have Churchill, okay? These little dinky pest holes on the other side of the world, afraid that the next dictator totalitarian is going to take them over and steal their little bread. Churchill stood for, you know, individualism, for liberty on, on a grand scale, it, you know, especially a man of his era, okay? And, and when, Brit when the British Empire, when Great Britain, when Great Britain was great, <laughs> doesn't deserve that title anymore, but, um, and so his legacy is, you know, still, you know, it's still with us to this day. I think... Uh, my question for you, Andy: Greatest Brit ever? Uh, I, 
That's an interesting question. I hadn't considered it. I mean, we, we different fields off the top of my we head. Got, Shakespeare yeah. would have to be in the discussion. John Locke would have to be in the discussion. Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton would have to be in the discussion. Newton for sure, uh, and maybe uh, Charles Darwin. And for me personally, I put Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin in there, but that's a personal <laughs> preference. But, but if we go to music, if if we go to music, John Winston Lennon. Born October 1940, and that Winston refers to uh, Churchill. So, uh, one of the top Brits of all time. A, yeah, a, a, politically, a great nation. In, in, right. If we if we limit the discussion to politics and states statesmanship, I think it's it's yeah. Churchill. There's a lot of great statesmen in Britain's past, you know, including Gladstone, you know, and any and any, no, yeah. any number of others. But I think Churchill would have to. Uh, take the title there for guiding Britain through the darkest hour uh, and triumphing over the, the yeah. gravest yeah. threat to European life yep. and liberty that had, the, that national socialism that has ever existed uh, in, in, until yeah. communism followed right on its heels, which <laughs> yeah. was just as bad. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would say Churchill politically, and and uh, and even in the discussion when we include all these other great Brits from other fields, Locke in philosophy and Newton in science and Shakespeare yes. and Milton in literature. Even then, I think he's in the discussion. So uh, yeah. what, I, I, I know there's, I know there's a, couple of, a, couple, yeah, a couple of points you want to make uh, you know, before, before we yeah. wrap up. I just want to say one thing. Sure. It reminds me of what you were saying before. Right. What you were saying before when Churchill answered that little kid, yes, you know, I'm the greatest man in the world, I'll bugger off. Uh, the, uh, it reminds me, I'm sitting in graduate class mm -hmm. years ago was we're, we're, go, we're studying Aristotle, my, my, my soon-to-be dissertation mentor, H.S. Thayer, who was uh, mentioned because he was a real gentleman and he was a, and he was a, a real philosopher. And, you know, he's, tra he's going through his, using his own translations of Aristotle's, uh, I, I think it was Nicomachean Ethics. And he's reading some mm -hmm. passage that was very touching in Aristotle. He looked up and he said, you always respect Aristotle. At times you love him. And that's what you, you reminded me of, you know, when, when you mentioned that scene. You when always Churchill. respect yeah. Churchill. Yeah, you always respect Churchill. Yeah. At times you don't love him. At other times you do. But you always respect yeah. him. And, and, not, and more than respect him. Admire him as the greatest statesman of the 20th century and probably the greatest statesman in British history. Um, yeah. but, but, so before we sign off, Perfect. I know I know you had a few Perfect. public service announcements. Yeah. Right? So today's September 2nd, which we call that Le Shrug Day. And yeah, if I could just Shrug mention right? a bit of <laughs> well, right. we we chose this day because September 1st, 1939, was the start of World War II, and we wanted to connect Churchill to that. And Eddie's done a lot on Atlas Shrugged, covered in the hero show Ayn Rand, so we weren't going to duplicate that. But OSI has, we have courses. I'm starting a course on super systems, your super system for flourishing. I started on Tuesday. Uh, we have other podcasts, John. Uh, Hersey, who did the Hero Show with Andy for about a year, he has Philosophy for Flourishing. Thomas Walker and Angel Worth have um, Innovation Celebration, and Aaron Briley has Culture and Causation. So we have four podcasts. We have a lot of OSI is doing a lot of work, a lot of good work. So I just want to share that as a, as a kind of a public service announcement there. And then just closing on Churchill, one of my favorite expressions about him. We could say this about him and heroes like him. Never have so many owed so much to so few. He said that about the RAF, right? Winning the, winning yes, he the, did. But we say that Britain. about him. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> and 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 one and one inspirational point that I'd want to close with. I don't remember the exact wording, but what he he said: uh, success is not final, failure is yeah. not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Was some, some words to that? That is it. That, that is right. That's yeah. a good ending note uh, for yeah, Churchill. Yeah, yep. failure. Failure is not final. The heroes recognize failure is not final. Obstacles yeah. are just things to be overcome. Said another That's great Brit, right. uh, Ernest Shackleton, and Churchill right. faced some mighty, daunting obstacles, and he overcame them. And I'm going to salute Winston Churchill here, Robert, and say <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your service. Or I should say, thank you for your life dedicated to, to defending yes. liberty against 
uh, national socialism and communism. And Robert, I yes. want to wish you uh, have a heroic day, have a heroic weekend. And everybody out you there in Hero you. Land, let's all of us here, yeah, let's yeah. try and lead a more heroic life. So we'll be back next week with Thank the you. Hero. See you then. <laughs>